Today, NextGen Ryzen APU reviews have a problem. Intel's NextGen Desktop Specs leak, AMD gives out more frames, and this was the reason AMD delayed Ryzen 9000? Welcome everyone to Gamer Melt. Starting things off, some of you may or may not know, but AMD's next-gen Ryzen AI 300 series laptops have been reviewed. And unfortunately, there's kind of some issues with it. Don't get me wrong, there aren't any issues with reviewers. They didn't do a bad job or anything like that. This isn't even a manufacturing issue. This is purely an issue with the problems that arise with notebooks themselves. See, with PCs, you can actually take away a lot of the variables, like using the same cooler, making sure you use the same amount of RAM, all of that kind of stuff, but that can't really be done with notebooks. And because of that, there can be some really wide disparities in performance between the notebooks that have the same processors in them. Case in point, the new Ryzen AI HX370. See, a lot of reviewers are actually reviewing the new ZenBook by Zeus, and it's actually very understandable. It's incredibly thin. We're talking it's like 0.02 millimeters thicker than the MacBook Airs, so it, it really is pretty nice, and it's very powerful for how thick it is. The problem is that it looks like not many reviewers got their hands on the ProArt model, which actually allows it to get way more performance. Believe it or not, there's actually a really big difference in wattage between these models as well. You can see right here that the Ryzen AI 9 HX370 operates at 33 slash 23 watts in the ZenBook, while a whopping 80 slash 65 watts in the ProArt PX13 and 80 watts in the large ProArt P16. Now, like they say, at a maximum of 80 watts, the power draw is still significantly lower than the 115 watts of Intel's current Meteor Lake mobile processors can consume. And a lot of these reviewers are kind of comparing these to much higher wattage CPUs. Now, that's completely understandable. Like I said, it's really hard to make all of this work out and also show how much performance you can expect out of that laptop, all of that. But when we're strictly comparing the performance of the actual processors, this is, of course, an issue. Either way, I just kind of wanted to go over the fact that you can get so much more performance out of these. So if you're looking at picking up one of AMD's new Ryzen AI chips, you really want to make sure that you're looking at these properly. For example, as you can see right here, this is multi-core performance with Cinebench R23. And as you can see, the ZenBook S16 gets 16,522 points here, but same exact processor, just in a different notebook, and obviously that allows for higher TDP, we are talking the ProArt PX13 and 16 get over 40% more performance. That's not a little bit of an addition here. I mean, that is like a brand new CPU, yet these both come with the same processor. Not only that, but if we look at the comment from the reviewer from Anantech, you can see that they actually state that the default TDP is just 17 watts. This is for the ZenBook, but AMD asked reviewers to bump it up to 28 watts. Now, that's nothing against this reviewer because they did put that it was 28 watts in there, but if you were to purchase this thinking that you're gonna get this performance without switching it over to 28 watts, well, you're gonna be sorely mistaken. Ultimately, I'm really just trying to say for anyone who's looking to purchase a new notebook, make sure you know what you're getting. And next up for today, we're finally starting to get specs for Intel's next-gen Core Ultra 200 series desktop CPUs. Specifically, we've actually gotten boost clocks. Now, this leak originally comes from Raichu on Twitter, who's certainly gotten multiple leaks right in the past. Either way, right here, we actually have a comparison between those next-gen CPUs versus their 14th-gen Raptor Lake refresh. And as you can see, just like we had seen before too long, it looks like at least for the P cores, they actually got a clock reduction. And starting things off, for the highest end model, we have the Core Ultra 9 285K, which this one being the absolute worst here. As you can see, the P core boost, at least according to this, is now at 5.7 gigahertz, which is a whopping 300 megahertz lower than current gen parts. With that said, the E cores did get a 200 megahertz boost. And like I said before, that's not necessarily a bad thing because the E cores outnumber the P cores. But at least in this case, 
it actually loses more in P cores than it gains in E cores. So it could ultimately be more of a wash here, at least at the high end. Then again, they are also losing hyperthreading, though they're sort of doing something new for that. We'll really have to see how that goes. But luckily, things get way better as we move down the stack. For example, the Core Ultra 7 265K only loses 100 MHz versus the Raptor Lake Refresh, while it gains a whopping 300 MHz in E Core. So ultimately, this one should get a very nice boost, and it gets even better when we move down to the Core Ultra 5 series. Here you can see that once again it loses 100 MHz in the P Core boost, but this time it gains a whopping 6 100 megahertz in their e-cores. Basically, the lower end SKUs should see a very nice boost if this does end up being correct, while the highest end may not really get much, at least out of core clocks. And next up, AMD just announced, seemingly out of nowhere, their next generation frame generation tech called Fluid Motion Frames 2. Now, for those who may not know, this particular frame generation, I know it gets a little bit complicated, but this is the one that pretty much works on every single game because it works on the driver level. Either way, this one adds quite a few new things it's fairly interesting first up they actually added ai optimizations as you can see right here it says we know many of you have asked for more control over how afmf works with your game so with amd fluid motion frames 2 we've introduced two new modes where the optimal settings are automatically enabled, but advanced users can adjust them. The first is search mode, which controls frame generation smoothness by improving how fallback works in AFMF2. Fallback refers to when AFMF frame generation is temporarily disabled in high motion scenes to ensure the best interpolated image quality, which can sometimes cause jitters. So basically it does this on the fly, but then we actually have something called performance mode. It says the second adjustable mode available in this is performance mode. And this is an all new setting, obviously, pretty much does what it sounds like. The auto mode is essentially the original one, which was quality, but performance reduces the overhead of AFMF2 to help make high frame rate game experiences more achievable on a wider range of devices. Specifically, this is more beneficial and it actually is used as the auto setting when you're using a Ryzen processor with Radeon graphics, i.e. an APU. Obviously, being able to pick between performance versus fidelity is a nice choice and a lot of people have different opinions about that. And next up, they basically made the frame generation have lower latency. As you can see, it says we also made notable improvements in reducing the latency added by frame generation with the latest version of AFMF. Specifically, they gave two games. Cyberpunk 2077 got 28% lower latency, and then in Counter-Strike 2, it saw a 12% reduction in latency. Not massive, but obviously when we're talking about the latency that's brought about by frame generation, every little bit helps. Not only that, but I actually should have talked about this first, but as you can see, it also supports borderless full screen. Before, it only really supported exclusive full screen, but now it does allow for borderless, which obviously will help in certain games for people who prefer that. It also has full support for Vulkan and OpenGL games. Basically, this is a really nice update. It's added support for tons of games, given OpenGL and Vulkan are now supported, and you have more options when it comes to how you want to use the tech. And lastly for today, if you follow the channel, you know that not too long ago, AMD delayed their Ryzen 9000 desktop CPUs. Now, at the time, there was a lot of parallels being made between all of the issues Intel's 13th and 14th gen CPUs were having. So a lot of people were thinking that maybe this was something similar, so AMD wanted to make sure it didn't ultimately happen. Well, that is absolutely not the case here. Well, it is somewhat a problem, but nothing like Intel's CPUs, which I will say I was at least a little suspect, just because AMD really only delayed these like a couple weeks, so I didn't think it was gonna be some huge problem, but I didn't know that it was this much of a not problem. As you can see right here, this CPU is the Ryzen 9 97, 100x hmm that's not right yeah that should be a ryzen 7 
That's right. According to this, a batch of Ryzen 7 9700X processors were shipped with the incorrect label Ryzen 9 9700X. Not only that, but apparently some of the other ones you can see right here, this is an update from Tom's Hardware that the Ryzen 5 9600X was mislabeled as Ryzen 9. Basically, there was technically an issue with their CPUs not meeting full quality expectations, but it's nothing like what anyone thought. So while that does it for today, were you getting a little worried about AMD delaying the Ryzen 9000 CPUs? Let me know down in the comments below. And if you liked the video, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up. And as always, have a great day.